Hi friends. So today we are going to discuss about a very interesting modality which is called as PET scan. Now, what is a PET scan? How does a PET scanner look like? So if you see in this particular animation here, appearance wise externally, it looks very similar to a CT or an MR machine. But internally, it's functioning wise, it is entirely different. So there is a gantry, there is a table on the table patient is lying and the table slides inside. What is PET? PET stands for Positron Emission Tomography. Tomography means what? It is a cross-sectional imaging modality and the radioisotope or the radionuclide which is used in PET scan is a radionuclide which emits positrons and that is the that is how the name Positron Emission Tomography was created. Now let us first quickly discuss what are the important applications of PET scan. The most important application is cancer imaging. So anything and rather everything about cancer, right, for these indications, PET scan is used. So for a diagnosis of the primary tumor, primary diagnosis, for staging to look for distant metastasis, to look for the response to treatment, as well as if the patient has been treated, right, completed the treatment, patient has been cured to look for recurrence also, PET scanner is used. So anything and everything related to cancer, PET scan is used basically for cancer imaging. Now, what is this radionuclide which is used in PET scan, which emits positrons? It is 18 fluoro deoxyglucose. So 18 FDG, remember, is the most common radionuclide which is used in PET scan. So 18 FDG is the most common radionuclide which is used. Now it is synthesized in a cyclotron. So it is specifically synthesized inside a cyclotron, right? And that is how it is created and then it is used. Now see, this is how the basic schematic simplified structure of glucose is. Now what is the radionuclide which is used? It is in PET scan, it is 18F. So what happens basically is that one hydroxyl group of the glucose, as you can see here, is replaced by this 18F. So this 18 fluorine displaces one hydroxyl group of glucose and that is how you get 18 fluoro deoxy glucose. So after all, I want you to remember that it is actually a radioactive form of glucose. The half-life of 18 FTG is around 110 minutes. Now, it is a radioactive form of glucose. Remember, it is the most common radionuclide used in PET scan. We already discussed this. But why is it the most common one to be used? Now the answer to this basically lies not in radiology but the answer as to why FTG is, pet, is the most common one to be used in PET scan lies in your pathology. If you have read neoplasia well from pathology, what is a tumor, right? What is a cancer? How does it, how is a neoplasm or a cancerous tumor defined as? It is defined as an abnormal mass of tissue and this mass of tissue, the growth of which actually exceeds that of normal tissues and it is uncoordinated with that of normal tissues. So of the various changes that occur inside a cancer cell, the various cell cycle checkpoints are inactivated. So one of the most important property of a cancer cell is to divide very rapidly. So cancer cell is replicating very rapidly. Now if a cancer cell has to replicate so rapidly and form a tumor mass, right? Then tell me, this cell replication which is going to happen inside a cancer cell, is it an active process or a passive process? Does it require energy, right? This cell replication that happens within a cancer cell, remember, it is an active process. So it is going to require energy. From where does this energy come? What is the energy currency of the cell? The energy currency of the cell is ATP. So the cancer cell has to generate its own excess ATP and this ATP has to be then utilized by the cancer cell for cell division, isn't it? So this is where the mechanism for the use of FDG or glucose FDG lies for and that is what a cancer cell remember is an extremely extremely glucose hungry cell and what is FDG it is 18 fluorodeoxy glucose it is in fact a radioactive form of glucose right now see let us what let us see what happens you know when we look at you know how the cancer cell actually works now here schematically on the screen I have shown you two cells one is a normal cell the other one is a cancer cell let us see how they differ from one another now a normal cell does not have to divide or you know proliferate rapidly right so because it does not have to you know proliferate rapidly it has a very low baseline glucose requirement 
Now, on the whereas a cancer cell has a property to divide very rapidly, right? So this glucose is taken up inside the cell by using GLUT transporters in biochemistry. You must have studied GLUT one, two, three, four, five. So because it has a baseline glucose requirement, there are only GLUT trans two GLUT transporters on a normal cell. But a cancer cell has to divide very rapidly, so it has a very high glucose requirement. So it has multiple GLUT transporters on its cells. So in cancer cells specifically, remember it is this GLUT. type 1 transporter which is overexpressed on the cell surface of a cancer cell so what happens basically now see a normal cell has only two glut transporters cancer cell has multiple ones so if there is a lot of glucose which is going around in the blood stream as you can see here can you tell me where will most of this glucose be taken up into naturally because the number of transporters are more on the cancer cell most of the glucose is going to be taken up into the cancer cell isn't it right now be it for glucose right so or be it for fdg fdg is what fluorodeoxy glucose so similar to glucose this most of the fdg that we will inject into the blood stream it will be taken up by what it will be taken up by the cancer cell right isn't it so the most of the fdg that we actually inject is also going to be taken up into the cancer cell and that is how most of the fdg goes inside the cancer cell now let us see what happens when glucose or fdg goes inside the cancer cell right suppose glucose goes inside the cancer cell now everything which is re required for atp synthesis is over expressed so glut transporters are more glucose is pushed into glycolysis all enzymes of glycolysis the first enzyme is what hexokinase it is over expressed so this hexokinase jumps on glucose and produces 6p glucose as you can see there similarly when fdg goes inside the cell this hexokinase in the hurry and flurry of using up all the glucose this hexokinase enzyme also jumps on the fdg and it produces 6p fdg inside the cancer cell it is only at this point when the cancer cell has already 6 phosphorylated this particular fdg you know it is at this point that the cancer cell suddenly realizes oh my god this is not glucose but this is fdg by this time it has already 6 phosphorylated it and that is how this fdg is going to get trapped within the cancer cell so this is how the fdg that we inject most of it will be taken up into the cancer cell it will also be trapped inside the cancer cell now therefore remember that this is also one of the mechanisms of cancer cachexia why does a cancer patient become cachexic because all the glucose all the nutrition in the blood stream is taken up by this cancer cell right whereas it is stealing nutrition from the normal cells and therefore uh, the normal body tissues are going to lose their mass cancer patient becomes cachexic right before we move ahead i want you to know another important principle about you know the cancer cells and that principle is the principle of warburg effect this was actually established by a physiologist by the name of otto warburg he was also awarded the nobel prize in physiology for his uh, invention now what is this warburg effect what is the concept of warburg effect now let us have a look now how is basically glucose utilized by the cell now let us first focus on a normal cell in a normal cell right when glucose enters into the cell right the first step now in this situation what we are discussing oxygen is present but irrespective of whether oxygen is present or not the first step that glucose you know undergoes through is glycolysis and the result of this glycolysis is the production of pyruvate now if oxygen is present right in this situation oxygen is present we can see so this you know pyruvate is then pushed into the krebs cycle tca cycle oxidative phosphorylation and as a result 36 atps are produced isn't it so when o2 when oxygen is present glucose is utilized in such a way that 36 atps are produced now what happens for to a normal cell when oxygen is absent when oxygen is absent this glucose enters into the cell undergoes glycolysis pyruvate is produced can it go into the krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation no right because oxygen is not available so oxidative phosphorylation cannot occur so it is converted to lactate and how many atps are produced only two atps are produced this is basic biochemistry right now why are we discussing it here i we are discussing here because right we are going to see what happens inside a cancer cell let us quickly revise in a normal cell when oxygen is present we'll have glycolysis oxidative phosphorylation 36 atps are produced oxygen is absent right only glycolysis only 2 atps will be produced what happens inside a cancer cell is very peculiar remember what happens in a cancer cell basically is that when irrespective of you know the presence of oxygen so even when oxygen is present see what happens first step will be that glucose will undergo glycolysis and pyruvate will be produced so what is the next logical step this pyruvate should be pushed into 
the TCA cycle and oxidative phosphorylation so that 36 ATPs can be produced, right? So this is something that should happen this pyruvate should be pushed into Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation but the peculiarity of a cancer cell is that this process of the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation is inhibited or inactivated inside a cancer cell so what happens basically is that even when oxygen is present right oxidative phosphorylation cannot occur and so this pyruvate is converted into lactate and how many ATPs are produced only two ATPs are produced do you realize here that this is actually aerobic glycolysis? That is oxygen is present. Still, the cell is utilizing only glycolysis, right? So this, by as a result of this, you know what happens basically is that only two ATPs are produced. So this is a very inefficient mechanism of utilization of glucose, isn't it? Right? Now, there has been a lot of research going on as to why this Warburg effect exists, right? Why are these... Uh, TCA cycle oxidative phosphorylation inactivated in the cancer cell even when oxygen is present. Even when oxygen is present, why is the cell undergoing glycolysis? One of the explanations is that, right, this metabolites of pyruvate and lactate in a cancer cell, they are shunted towards production of intermediates which are required for cell replication. A cancer cell has to replicate very rapidly and therefore because all these metabolites or intermediates that are required for cell replication, they are going to be synthesized by this pyruvate and lactate and therefore a cancer cell has a distinct survival advantage as compared to the other cells. But do you realize that even when oxygen is present, right, only glycolysis is being used, only two ATPs are being produced. As a result, this is a very inefficient way of utilizing this particular glucose, isn't it? A normal cell can get 36 ATPs, right, from glucose, but a cancer cell, even in the presence of oxygen, is able to get only and only two ATPs, isn't it? So this is a very, very, very inefficient process, right, for using this glucose, right? So do you realize that we discussed that a cancer cell is extremely glucose hungry, right? Because it has to divide, it needs more glucose. And moreover, it is actually using a very inefficient way right to utilize this particular glucose this basically increases the glucose hunger of the cancer cell so do you really realize now how desperate the cancer cell is to utilize is to get to all this particular glucose right because it has to divide rapidly right and it uses it it in a very inefficient way so 18 fluorodeoxyglucose hence remember is the most common radionuclide used in pet scan because all of it is going to get focused into the cancer cell, right? So what happens basically is that when we inject FDG, because of the increased number of GLUT1 transporters, because of the glucose hungry nature of the cell, all this 18 FDG is going to be concentrated into what? Into this cancer cell, right? And that is how we are able to localize where cancer cells are in the body, you know, when we use this 18 FDG metabolite. Now, at this point, I want you to answer this particular question. In a PET scanner, the detectors within the machine Detect which of the following coming from the lesion in a patient's body. PET is what? PET stands for positron emission tomography. So what are emitted in the body? Positrons are emitted, isn't it? But do, therefore, you know, you might quickly look at the name of the, you know, technique and you can jump into the answer of A or positrons. Most of your competitors will, but I don't want my students to get it wrong. So remember, this is actually not the correct answer. Because positrons are emitted in the body, but do they reach the detectors of the machine? Do they come out of the body? The answer is no. What comes out of the body is actually gamma energy photons. And the answer to this lies in a beautiful mechanism that occurs inside the cell. And this is called as the annihilation reaction. Let us try to an understand what this annihilation reaction is. Now let us look at a cancer cell. Now inside a cancer cell, what happens? We have this 18 FDG which is trapped within a cancer cell. We have discussed this, right? Now this 18 FDG, it emits what? It emits positrons, right? Now positron is like a twin brother of electron. It is identical to an electron. So there is a positron which is beta plus and there is an electron which is beta minus. They are identical to each other except for the opposite charges. So what happens? When they move randomly in the tissues, there are a lot of tissue electrons which are also available and this positron is emitted by that FDG, right? So when they move randomly, right, in the tissue and they happen to collide with each other, right, annihilation reaction occurs. What is the meaning of annihilation? Now, Oxford Dictionary defines annihilation as meaning complete destruction or destruction of matter or mass. So what happens? 
when a positron and electron collide with each other annihilation occurs mass is destroyed both of these positrons and electrons both of them are destroyed and matter is converted into energy what comes out of the cell is a gamma energy photon did you understand what annihilation is let us quickly revise once a positron is emitted by fdg there are multiple tissue electrons when they collide with each other matter is destroyed both positron and electron are destroyed mass is converted into energy energy comes out of the cell in the form of gamma ray photons of around 511 kilo electron volts so both of them become destroyed matter is destroyed annihilation occurs and 511 kilo electron volts gamma energy photons two of them are emitted exactly in 180 degree opposite directions do you realize this is very peculiar so one gamma ray energy photon is not emitted there are two gamma ray photons which are emitted and that two in exactly opposite direction because they are being emitted exactly in an opposite direction this leads to another specific phenomenon which is seen only in pet scan and that is called as coincidence imaging coincidence imaging is specific for pet scan what is this coincidence imaging let us have a look now let us imagine that we are doing a pet scan of a brain region here and there is a tumor within the brain and at that site the fdg is going to be taken up positrons will be emitted annihilation will occur so what will happen two gamma ray photons are being emitted at 180 degree opposite to each other can you see that so here the two gamma ray photons are emitted 180 opposite degree in a 180 degree opposite direction they will reach those detectors and what will happen so the machine what it will do is it will read the signal from these two detectors because it is arising from a same point the signal will coincide perfectly as far as the signal configuration is concerned timing is concerned if this signal in these two detectors which are located 180 degree opposite to each other coincides the machine considers it to be true signal rest all the signals are you know ignored so when coincidence when this particular annihilation occurs at multiple points 180 degree opposite direction gamma ray photons are emitted right they reach the opposite detectors coincidence phenomenon is when the signal perfectly matches with each other from that data which is collected as a result of coincidence imaging a pet image is created what are pet images as you can see here pet images remember are color maps there are some areas which in this image which are appearing dark some areas in this image which are appearing bright so if you those dark areas are those that have low fdg uptake low metabolism whereas the bright areas have high fdg uptake high metabolism so they are likely to be malignant that is how pet scan image is actually a functional map or a metabolic map of that particular tissue